Why there are no lady monks in his car? Oh, there are. There are. I maybe couldn't see anyone. Maybe you have not anyone. seen. Okay. Because they are clad in sarees, maybe you cannot make out so easily. Okay. There are women. Okay. And there are children. So, just recently, an MP from Tamil Nadu commented that Sanatan Dharma should be uh, completely eliminated. You know, politicians make these kind of statements. I would only say that they do not know. Uh, uh, enough about uh, Sanatan Dharma. They might have seen some social manifestation, some inequality and social inequality and injustice that has happened. So in Vrindavan, there's going to be your, you know, planning to establish the world's tallest temple. It's going to be 700 feet, if I'm not wrong. But we already have a lot of ancient temples here in Vrindavan, which is dedicated for Lord Krishna. So what is the need to construct a new one. You know, someone may ask, uh, so many children are there, why are people having children? <laughs> but still, there is something very unique. So glad to have you on this podcast, sir. Um, it's my first time here in Mandavan. And this city, I should say, it's crazy, it's madness. People are, you know, all I hear is Radhe Radhe all the time. Like, why does it say, it's a city of Krishna, right? Then why people say Radhe Radhe all the time? Yes, Vrindavan is very special. Krishna is worshipped in our country all over, in different parts, in different states. But there is something very special about Vrindavan. Krishna has many, many devotees and among them, the foremost devotee is Srimati Radharani. And Krishna has said in the Shastras, if you worship, if you think you are my devotee, you are not my devotee. If you are a devotee of my devotee, you are truly my devotee. So, devotees want to be devotees of Radharani. Then Krishna will accept such a devotee more easily. So these are some of the devotional feelings and concepts. But there is a very deep philosophical foundation for all this. Who is Krishna? Who is Radha? These are all very profound concepts that have been discussed in the Vedic literatures. Krishna presents that in the Bhagavad Gita and that becomes even more deeper in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So these are foundational literatures among all the other Vedic literatures and these are these the concepts and the principles and the ideas presented there take on a new dimension of existential reality in Vrindavan because Krishna was present here and Radharani was present here. So that is why here you hear Radhe, Radhe because uh, by becoming a devotee of Radharani, if she recognizes, Krishna will certainly recognize. That's, that's amazing. But how did all, you know, started for you personally becoming a monk and all? How did you become that? Because you're already giving me that calm, peaceful kind of vibe. So how did all started for you? <laughs> I was a college student. Mm -hmm. uh, I was studying in Coimbatore. When I first came in touch with Srila Prabhupada's books. And uh, I'm from Bangalore. So I would go back and forth. And uh, I kept studying further. And then at a certain point, I decided, I became very convinced. I was never, I never expected that I will be a monk in my life with this kind of a hairstyle. <laughs> uh, I was very fascinated with science and I wanted to do research. I wanted to be a teacher. And that's the way I was thinking I would be. But uh, 
things changed. Uh, I became very strongly influenced by Srila Prabhupada's presentation. By the way, Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya of ISKCON and uh, he wrote many books in English, the Bhagavad Gita translations and many other books. Those books deeply philosophically influenced me. But another important turning point was when I read the life of Srila Prabhupada. His life was an immaculate reflection of what he believed and what he taught. Usually, you know, sometimes people talk big, big philosophy ah. and you see their personal life, they have another kind of yes, a life. Yes, yes, yes. But in Srila Prabhupada's life, there was perfect harmony between what he taught, what he believed and what he lived by. So, when I read the life of Srila Prabhupada, the sacrifice he made, the dedication he showed, and the devotion and commitment he had, despite all kinds of challenges and difficulties he faced in life. So, that moved me even more and made me dedicate my life. I was too young at that time, but I was very fascinated by these things. And somehow as we went on in life, uh, these things became reinforced even more and more. And uh, that's how uh, I have been uh, a devotee. Or actually, uh, to be a devotee of Krishna is a very big thing. It's not an easy state of consciousness. Why so? It's a very advanced stage of consciousness. Okay. If you technically see the definition of bhakti as given in the Narada Pancharatra, Sarvopadi vinirmuktam tatparatvena nirmalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti ruchyate. You know, we all have different kinds of designations. I'm a man. I'm a woman, I'm this many years old, I'm Indian, I'm American, I'm intelligent, I'm very smart, I'm stupid. All of these are called upadi. They are coverings, designations for the soul. The soul is actually free from all of these designations. The soul has only one attribute, one principal attribute, which is I'm a loving servant of Krishna. This is what Krishna explains in the Gita. Mamai vamsho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. All the living entities are my amsha eternally. And being amsha, we serve the whole. Amsha means part. Whole, purna. So Amsha has to serve the Purna. Part has to serve the whole. Just like in my body, there are many parts of the body. I have a lungs, heart, and different other organs, kidneys. All of them are serving the whole body. If any of them are not serving the whole body, I'll not be sitting here, I'll be running to a hospital. For sure. Isn't it? Yeah. So, this is the nature or the constitutional makeup of a part. It has to serve the whole. So, uh, Krishna explains that in the Bhagavad Gita, that Amsha, all the Jivas are Amsha of Bhagavan, Sri Krishna. And so we must serve him. And that service is a loving service, not uh, some kind of a slavery you better serve, otherwise I will. <laughs> no. Devotees want to happily, lovingly serve the Lord, just like a mother serves the child. So it's a loving service, and that loving service is called bhakti. And that bhakti, to be truly philosophically as given in the Shastras to be accurate, it should be free from all conceptions of these false designations. 
I'm a man and I'm a woman. Like for instance, I'm a man in this life. In my previous life, I had li another situation, I had another body. I don't even have a remembrance of that. You see? So this understanding that I'm a man, I'm so many years old, I'm Indian, I'm this or that, this will all be gone with time. So these are temporary upadis. So sarva upadi vinirmuktam. When our consciousness is free from all these misconceptions of who I am and tat paratvena nirmalam and dedicated to Krishna tat paratvena nirmalam and free from all mala, pure and hrishikena hrishikesha sevanam hrishika hrishikesha means Krishna, another name of Krishna it means he is the master of senses, he is the owner of senses. All our senses are actually owned by him. So, Rishi Kena, when all my senses are engaged in the service of the Lord, Bhakti Rujyate, that is called Bhakti. So that's a very elevated state. So we are trying to become Bhaktas. It's a very elevated state to be a Bhakti. If I'm not wrong, you're around 60 years old, right? Yeah. <laughs> but how do you manage to look so young? Like, you don't look like 60 at all. <laughs> no, no. I think we have a shaved head. That creates the deception. No, even your skin at all, it's so glowing. Like, how, how, how do you manage that? Because I've seen people of 60 years, they certainly don't look like you. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> it's just, I think, different bodies. Look okay, different. so you manage any specific diet or something or just... Oh the... yes, our diet, our mm -hmm. lifestyles are very highly regulated. This is part of sadhana. Okay. So, uh, we rise very early in the morning mm -hmm. and uh, by about 3.30, it's a part of the discipline. Mm -hmm. And we come to the temple and we have early morning arati. It's mm -hmm. called Mangal Arati, the first arati at 4.30 a.m. And then uh, we have some chanting of the mantras and arati and then we all do japa. Okay. That is part of the sadhana. Nama japa, Hari okay. Nama japa or Krishna Nama japa. We chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Like this, chanting and hearing for about two hours. Ha. So that's a daily discipline. Do you do any yoga? Uh, we do bhakti yoga. Okay. Uh, uh, we do not do, not that we can't do, uh, you know, the asanas and the pranayama. Uh, we do that, but that's not a rigorous thing, but our focus is on bhakti. bhakti. And bhakti involves these things. And our practice of bhakti, you know, in ISKCON, Srila Prabhupada comes in the parampara of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a bhakti saint okay. about 500 years ago. Okay. Oh, he was a very important saint. He was born in Bengal mm -hmm. and uh, he lived for a long time in Puri. But he went walking, traveling all over India, all over South India. He went all the way up to Kanyakumari then walked up along the western coast and came back to Puri. And he also traveled to Prayag, Varanasi, Vrindavan and again went back. And he, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, 500 years back, in our country there was a lot of caste restrictions. Ha. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, worked against those kind of currents in the society. Uh, People were thinking that spirituality is only for the Brahmins. And the Brahmins, they only have that one and it's not for others. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no. Bhakti to Krishna, love of Krishna is for everyone. Everyone can embrace, everyone can take up this path of bhakti. And the people who opposed him most were the Brahmins. Huh. Because they thought that their stronghold of spirituality, their position in the society will be diminished. 
and they were concerned about those kind of things. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very strongly talked about this, preached this message, invited everyone to chant the names of Krishna. Because, you know, in different yugas, there are different yugas, and now the yuga we are in is called Kali Yuga. Huh. Before that was Dwapar Yuga, and before that was Treta Yuga, and before that was Satya Yuga. So these yugas change. And in each yuga, the circumstances in the society are different. And so the psychophysical and psychological state and development of the human being is also different. And so for self-realization, for developing bhakti and God-realization, there are different methods that are recommended for different ages. There is a verse which says, Krite Yadhyayato Vishnu Tretayam Makaihi Dwapare Paricharyayam Kalau Tad Harikirtana. What was possible in Satya Yuga or Krita Yuga is known as Satya Yuga also. By dhyana, by meditation, one would go to the forest, one would go to the Himalayas and do meditation. And in Treta Yuga, the process of God realization was makaihi by doing fire sacrifice, havans, homa, yagna, fire sacrifices. And in Dwapar Yuga, it was temple worship, elaborate temple worship. But in Kali Yuga, the circumstances of people are such that they can't go to the forest, they can't go to the Himalayas, we all have jobs, people have jobs, we have families, it's not practical. Havan, it is expensive, not everyone can afford that. And even Brahmanas are not very powerful in this age. Yeah. In, in Treta Yuga, they would chant the mantras and the, by the power of the mantra there will be fire. Now we don't have such Brahmanas. And elaborate temple worship, everyone cannot do. Sometimes you can visit a temple, festival you can visit a temple. Otherwise, everybody is busy in their homes and families and businesses and professions. Uh, so, don't you think if you're willing, you can find a way? Because my can. father is someone who would never eat food without visiting a temple. We don't have that quality, but he you still see, has. You see, already from your father's generation uh, to your generation, yeah. <laughs> it is diminishing. Yours, maybe your father was a very good example. But by and large, not so often we come across yeah. these things. And in Kali Yuga, because of all these challenges, a simple method that is recommended, the Kalautad Hari Kirtanat, the same benefit we can get by Hari Kirtana or Krishna Kirtana means to chant the names of Krishna Hari. And that is why we chant this Hare Krishna mantra and hear the mantra. And by that, Kirtana. And we also have bhajans. You must have seen yesterday. Oh, yes, yes. Bhajans. It was and amazing. Also, and also singing and dancing. Yes. This was introduced by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Actually, it is there in the Puranas. Mm -hmm. It's there in the Shastras. And he popularized it. So, uh, you know, actually, even when I, I come from South India, and I, these were all unfamiliar to me. Yes. And uh, not so, you know, oh, what's this? They are singing and dancing. You know, 40 years back, I'm talking about. <laughs> now, at least there is... So much television and awareness is there all over the country. Uh, so at that time it was different. Uh, but then it, these are methods recommended. Krishna, Kirtana, Gana, Nartana, Paro. So this is what all the previous saints and acharyas, they were also singing and dancing. So in other words, uh, Krishna Kirtana, Krishna Bhakti in Kali Yuga, it's a very celebratory form of worship of the Lord. You know, it's not passive, it's not withdrawn, it is not silent, it's dynamic, it's active, singing and glorifying and dancing. Uh, but this is not some kind of an artistic performance to please the audience. Yes. It's more of a, a spiritual, devotional outpouring from the heart of a devotee, offering to himself or herself to Krishna that I want to surrender to you, I want to love you, I want to serve you. That's the kind of a uh, worship of Krishna that is called Sankirtana that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu popularized. And that is the method recommended for this age, Kali Yuga. 
I would 100% agree on that because even I danced yesterday. <laughs> so it was like really amazing. So isn't it? Yeah, it's really amazing. It's just you can't resist yourself when no. you know the the music and this vibe you can't really resist yeah. yourself. Now you see when you sing and dance in the middle of a musical uh, performance and bhajans and kirtans like that we you used a very nice word I forgot myself. Yeah. Right? You forget yours. I'm a man. I'm a woman. Upadi was upadis were gone. Yeah. Sarva upadi vinir mukta. That is a feature of bhakti. <laughs> so, kirtana, hari kirtana induces and it inspires this bhakti in the hearts of everyone. That's the power of sankirtana. Definitely I would agree on that one. <laughs> so, do you believe in afterlife? An afterlife? Yeah. Okay. You see, we believe, we understand, we discuss everything on the basis of Shastra. Okay. Because Shastra becomes, the Vedic literatures become the source of knowledge and information and enlightenment for us. Because the Shastras say, our senses are imperfect. Our mind, intelligence have limitations. So we cannot comprehend all of reality by ourselves. Like for example, I'll tell you. In this room while we are sitting here, there are radio waves. Our eyes cannot see. Yeah. But our mobile phone can detect it. Yes. So you see how our senses are limited? Absolutely. So our mind, our intelligence, all of them have limitations. So we as a human being, we have some cognitive powers, ability to understand reality, but it's not unlimited power. It is a limited power. I'll give you another example. According to science, chimpanzees have a very genetic makeup, which is very similar to human beings. Yes. Right? About 95%, 98%, some, some something like that, scientists say. Now, say for instance, we had a chimpanzee here sitting on the sofa next to us. And we want to talk to the chimpanzee about bhakti, about, uh, you know, Bhagavad Gita, anything. He will not understand. Obviously. He, is, he may be 98% uh, genetically like us, but he is a 100% beast. For sure. He cannot understand anything. Like that. So, uh, his cognitive powers don't allow him to comprehend certain things. In fact, according to science, he's a mammal. We are mammals. His nervous system and our nervous system are pretty much similar. We have two lobed brains and we have a vertebrae. brain. He also has a vertebrae. So many things that the neural mechanism of cognition for us and for him are quite similar. But our comprehension powers are so much different. Like say for if I have to talk to the chimpanzee and tell him, we have a constitution in our country, we elect the prime minister, we elect a chief minister for five years and everyone can vote. He cannot understand any of those things. Yeah. So now you see he has cognitive limitation. Actually Shastras say even human beings have cognitive limitations. It's not that we can understand all of reality. Our understanding, our comprehension also comes to an end. There is sure. more, so much more reality beyond that. I'll give you an example. Suppose, I, suppose I'm confined in a room and in that room there is one window and I can't get out. And what do I do? I go around and then I look at the window as much as possible I can see. There is a cone of vision I can see through the window. I can only see what is in the cone of, wind, of that vision. Anything that's out of the cone of vision, I don't know what it is. If something comes flying into the cone of vision, I'll say, oh, there's a bird. And after it goes away, I don't know where it went, what happened. So all of us have five co windows to look at through this body called the five senses. Each of them give us a certain impression of the reality, a visual impression, an auditory impression, olfactory impression, impression through some taste and touch. So we get a certain understanding of the world around us through the senses. 
but this is not the everything of the reality and hence if we want to talk about things like after life or before life all these things we take the information from the shastra and bhagavad gita is one of the important literature and where krishna explains actually we are not this body we are a soul inside the body it is the soul which has consciousness it is a soul which has pragna it has the soul which has the ability to understand and 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 perceive things that is why suppose i die my eyes will still be there somebody can open my eyelid the eyeball is there the retina is there you can keep some object and an image is formed in the retina of the eye but i have gone because i cannot ah, see you put that so nicely yeah that's how the shastra krishna explains that way and so soul is the one which is conscious and that soul krishna explains is nitya ajo nityam shashvato yam purano nahanyate hanyamane sharire it is unborn it is it never dies when the body dies the soul is not nahanyate hanyamane sharire sharire hanyamane soul nahanyate is not destroyed so we are that soul and after a certain time de- de- decided by the laws of nature my soul will leave this body and move on to another situation and then people around they'll get rid of this body by turning it in, into ashes that's the end of it but the soul moves on and i am that soul this is the information we get from the shastra we take this information understand that analyze that with using reason and logic and in this way we get to understand certain realities which our senses and mind cannot access so that's how we develop our understanding these but shastras and literature these are all written some thousand years back how can it still be relevant because the times are changing now yeah you know times may change the shastras address certain fundamental aspects of reality which has not changed I'll give you an example. Krishna says in the Gita in the 13th chapter he gives a list of items and he says these constitute knowledge wisdom enlightenment. Okay? So one of the items he mentions is janma mrutyu jara vyadhi dukha doshanu darshanam. He says there are four inescapable realities of life for everyone and number 1 is there is birth number 2 there is disease number 3 there is old age and finally there is death janma mrutyu jara old age vyadhi is disease simple sanskrit everyone can follow So Krishna says janma mrutyu jara vyadhi dukha doshanu darshanam these are the sources of miseries for us isn't it who likes to get disease say for instance we are sitting here just around 10 kilometers there are hospitals here and there are icus in the hospital and there is somebody inside the icu there are some people outside is it happy situation did they choose to go to the icu no you may choose to go to your mall you may choose to go to your movie theater you may choose to go to an airport but nobody chooses to go to a hospital or an icu under circumstances we have to rush there and it's very painful so these are the causes of miseries disease just recently we or the whole world came out of the covid pandemic and it was so miserable people were scared whether we will live at all or something can happen to us so it's not you know it's not a vyadhi diseases of causes of miseries and old age everyone likes to remain young yeah. 
and old age sets in. We have no control with every passing, rising and setting of the sun. We are one day older. Today we are one day older than we were yesterday. And this is going to go on and on and on. And bodies will become weak. Skins become, skin becomes wrinkled. And young people start becoming, doing prominent things. And the old people are pushed to the sideline. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody likes that. These are realities. And finally, there is death. Who likes to die? If there is a fire alarm and says, everyone, there is fire in the building, everyone will start running. Because no one likes to die. But these are inescapable realities. And jatasya hi dhruvam rutyu, dhruvam janma mrutasya cha. Just like everything that is born dies, everything that dies has to take birth again. So these are the four inescapable realities which is actually source of misery for us. And Krishna points out another important thing. This is the defect of material existence. We shun away from these. We don't want these things. Actually, this is not natural for us. To die, to get old, to suffer. This is not natural for the soul. Got it. Just like you take a fish out of water and you put it on the land, how it will be wriggling for life. That is what we are going through. The soul is put in this material atmosphere and subjected to birth, death, old age and disease. The soul is struggling. This is not natural. So this is the dukkha and dosha. And one who can see it this way, he is an enlightened person. Now you see this concept Krishna is saying in the Bhagavad Gita, even today it is relevant. It is not some, you know, thousands of years old thing and it's a, oh, you know, old people like that one, but we are all young and dynamic. But we also get disease, we also get old and we also have to die. So these realities, how to understand what is all this about? We come into this world, we go, where do we go? You know, if you had some, if you have experience that I have experienced that in our family, in friends, you know, so many acquaintances, somebody there was, he was a living person. He had fully full of emotions. He had aspirations. He had desires. He had plans. He, he was a living. Suddenly something, he's gone. Where did he go? He's inaccessible to us. And we see the body that we were relating with lying here. And we carry that and cremate it and turn it into ashes. And no one feels sorry about it. Okay, we'll feel sorry for some time, but then what can be done? We have to dispose the body. Damn. Isn't it? These are realities. So this is the knowledge that is given in the Bhagavad Gita is absolutely relevant today as it was any other time in the past and will be relevant in the future too. There's a common idea that ISKCON is for the allied people. Would you like to counter that? <laughs> no, uh, ISKCON only has connections with elite and it is not really true. Like for instance, an important program that began in ISKCON, Bangalore, is Akshaya Patra. Mm -hmm. It's a midday meal program. We started in Bangalore 23 years back in the year 2000. Okay. We started serving cooked meal to children in government schools. It started off a small, in a small way to five schools in the outskirts of Bangalore. We started serving and the children and the teachers welcomed us and we kept expanding that. Our model in Akshay Patra is to set up a centralized kitchen, cook food, nutritious food under controlled environment and then transport this to the class schools before lunch so that the children can have a lunch program lunch meal. So now in Bangalore, we have three kitchens and we are serving about two lakh children wow. every day. And you know, in government schools in our, in our country, it's the um, not so very privileged people, financially, economically privileged people send their children to school. 
especially in cities. Yes. Because there are a lot of opportunities, private schools. And like that. So then from Bangalore, we kept expanding. And we are also serving here in Vrindavan. In this campus, there is an Akshay Patra kitchen. We are feeding 1.25 lakh children every day of Mathura district. Like this, we have 67 kitchens in the country and we are serving 23 lakh children every day. This is one of the important programs of ISKCON and devotees are involved in it. And of course, there are also a lot of professional employees and staff also involved. It's a combination because how much you know, it requires, it's become a big program. And we are a Harvard Business School case study. We are a case study by Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and in Bangalore and many other you know, you know, institutions. So uh, this is for the common people to provide them food, which is so primary and fundamental. We believe giving food to a hungry person is God's work. And so it drives us, it motivates us, and it, it benefits the ch child in the school. The child is able to study well, come to school and study well, and if the child gets educated, he can come out of poverty. So, uh, so we are uh, having many such programs. In fact, we have another school, in, a tribal school, in a very, very remote place in Tripura, in northern Tripura. You know, you have to go there, it takes, after you have to go to Agartala, and from there you have to take, a, 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 by road, you have to go to a, a place called Dharamnagar, and which takes about some six hours. And after that, through the jungle and the hills, you have to go for another one hour, 45 minutes, and you'll come to our school there. And there are about 550 children getting free education, free meals, free uniform, all this funded by ISKCON devotees, ISKCON temples. So uh, we are in touch with the masses of people too. And we also have a philosophical aspect in, in uh, ISKCON. And that is understood, you know, to understand philosophy, it requires certain kind of, one kind of a mindset and people. So some people are attracted to that. And we also have, there is religious aspects of it. And so a lot of people come and we have grand temples. And, and I will share with you one interesting story from the life of Prabhupada, why we have grand temples. Okay. Okay? Very soon. Hare Krishna. Sure. Why there are no lady monks in Iskand? Oh, there are. There are? I maybe couldn't you see have anyone. Not seen okay. Because they are clad in saris, maybe you cannot make out so easily. Okay. There are women. Okay. And there are children. Okay. Yesterday you might have seen that video, Anandamayo. Uh, I think I missed that Short part. video is there. Okay. You, you can see that. It's uh, all done by women, monks mm -hmm. and children. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so it's my, there are, my there are okay. women also. Okay. Uh, very much. So, uh, you know, last two days we have been roaming around the city of, city of Vrindavan. Uh, I interacted with quite a few locals. <laughs> few of them okay. doesn't really approve the way of ISKCON. Like okay. when I interacted with them, okay. maybe they feel kind of threatened or so. I don't know exactly what is their point of view, but it's okay. not, they, they are not so welcomed about this okay. uh, What do you think about that? Maybe uh, are they scared of the institutionalized way of approaching things? Uh, there could be multiple reasons. But then if you had, if you had asked them about Akshaya Patra and Vrindavan Chandradai Mandir, mm -hmm. I guess you would have got a different response. Maybe, probably. <laughs> so here we function as Vrindavan Chandrodai Mandir mm -hmm. and uh, Akshay Patra is a very prominent activity here mm -hmm. because last about probably 18 or 19 years we have been involved in this. So there is a lot more reverence and acceptance for Chandrodai Mandir and okay. Akshay Patra, I would say. Okay, so uh, if I'm not in Iskan, in the name of Iskan, there are different managements. Yeah. Why so? In India, mm -hmm. there are two broadly two Iskan groups. Mm -hmm. One is the Iskan Bangalore group, mm -hmm. and there is the Iskan Mumbai group. Okay. 
So there is a slight but important theological understanding and practice between the two groups. Okay. So we are trying to resolve it. And, okay. Uh, you know, just like between brothers sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Differences right. happen. Yeah. So uh, on that aspect, but otherwise, uh, it's okay. a fact that there are two groups of uh, okay. ISKCON. So that's recently an MP from Tamil Nadu commented that Sanatan Dharma should be uh, completely eliminated, uh, you know, completely destroyed. Would okay. you like to comment on that? Anything? You know, politicians make these kind of statements. I would only say that they do not know uh, uh, enough about uh, Sanatan Dharma. They might have seen some social manifestations, some inequality and social inequality and injustice that has happened due to caste system. Definitely, that is not an acceptable thing that caste and the atrocities and, the, and those kind of things which came about. Uh, so, just like sometimes, you know, an eye develops a cataract. What we should do is go to a surgeon and remove the cataract. Not the whole eye. Not pluck the eye. Yeah. Wow. So, in the practice of Sanatan Dharma, in some, and some times in the history of humanity, there would have been some, you know, misunderstanding and misapplication. And as a result, there were atrocities and there were uh, things, uh, evil things which should not have happened. But that does not mean you have to throw the baby with the bathwater. So they are jumping a little bit too much. I would only, if I get an opportunity to talk to him, I will just convey this to him <laughs> and tell him that there are many things. That way in every field there will be. In politics, there are good politicians. Obviously. And there are politicians who are utterly bad. Yeah. In every field, in business, corporates, it will be like that. Everywhere it will In be science, that. it is like that. There are scientists who have also made some fake things and try to get away some things. In every field it is like that. So we should remove the cataract in all of these features, in all of these examples, and what the true discipline, what that true knowledge or, you know, seeks to achieve, that should be seen. So the core of Sanatan Dharma is about, uh, you know, doing good to people, how the society can be organized so that there is development, not only on the material plane, but also on the spiritual plane. So these are some of the things that Sanatan Dharma teaches. And we have to go on and I think that's the way the okay. world is. Yes, there will be some, somebody always criticizing something. Who will be saying such yeah. things. And we should at least inform and educate people so that they don't form wrong opinions. And that is our concern. For sure, for sure. Isn't it? So in Vrindavan, there's going to be your you know, planning to establish the world's tallest temple. It's going to be 700 feet, if I'm not wrong. But we already have a lot of ancient temples here in Vrindavan, which is dedicated for Lord Krishna. So what is the need to construct a new one? Okay. Uh, uh, you know, someone may ask, uh, so many children are there. Why are people having children? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> But still, there is something very <laughs> unique. Every uh, husband and wife, after they get married, they plan to have a child. Yeah. And that's the reality. So their child is very special for them. So in the same way, devotees, uh, there are many temples and we go and worship in all those temples, ancient temples. And devotees also have a desire that we want to build a temple for Krishna and offer to Krishna. Uh -oh. And in every temple, there will be some unique feature, unique aspects. Like just like every child will have some unique things that the parents will bring up the child to accomplish and achieve. So in the same way, uh, we have a desire here to add to the devotional feelings and the practices of the people of Vrindavan and people who come to Vrindavan through our temple too. And Srila uh, uh, Prabhupada, wanted our temples to distribute food, to distribute knowledge about Krishna, and to distribute the holy name of Krishna. 
So, uh, different acharyas have brought emphasis on certain aspects of the bhakti culture and we want to heighten that, uh, amplify that through our temple. So, yes, we want to have a nice grand temple. But it's going to be a huge project because building 700 feet temple is going to be a huge commitment. How are you, how you are planning to meet the ends? Like, it's not going to be easy, I'm sure. Yeah. It's going to, you know, money involves now. When you yeah. construct something, when you want to build something, there is yeah. money. Yeah. How are you going to, how you are planning to meet that yeah. part? So, primarily, like we have built this temple or in the process of building and completing this temple. It's the first phase of the Vrindavan Chandradai Mandir. As you rightly said, it is about 700 feet tall. Uh, we wanted it to be a skyscraper temple. Wow. That was the vision of Srila Prabhupada. Wow. You know, in the materialistic uh, world, people build skyscrapers to conduct their business of, uh, you know, whatever that Both is, make well. money and uh, have nice housing and all for uh, their self-enjoyment. So, let us build a temple, a skyscraper temple for Krishna. You know, because these monuments make a statement about the importance of the place. So, we want to have a skyscraper temple of Krishna in Vrindavan. I'll tell you one thing. Many people in India, especially South India, don't know Vrindavan. Yeah. They may know Mathura. Yes. They don't even know Vrindavan. What to speak of the people around the world? If I ask an average Indian, do you know Vatican? He will say yes. If you ask an average Italian, do you know Vrindavan? I can bet he does not know. Vrindavan is so much more important than Paris and Dubai and all of those things because Krishna was here. From here, the great message of Bhagavad Gita. Well, all of that came from here, from Krishna. So, should we not make Krishna, his message, his place, his land, well known all over the world? We should. And so, an iconic monument like this will make that statement about the importance of Krishna, about the importance of Vrindavan, and about the importance of Krishna's message to humanity. There were these kind of questions asked to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, once Prabhupada had opened a uh, grand temple and a uh, lot of visitors had come and some media persons had come and they came and asked Prabhupada, why did you build this grand temple? So Prabhupada said, you see for my bhakti, for my bhajana, I can sit under a tree and do my bhakti and bhajana. I can please Krishna and Krishna. I am happy with that. But would you have come and heard me? Today I have a grand temple. That is why you are coming here and you are seeing the temple and you are understanding about Krishna and you are asking me all these questions. So I built this temple for you, not for myself. So that is the spirit of our uh, practice also. We build gorgeous grand temples for Krishna. And to celebrate Krishna and his message and his festivals. But we lead a very simple life. Our life is austere. We take simple food. We offer grand food and distribute to people. But ourselves, we take simple food and we have simple life. We rise early in the morning. We do this uh, Arati, Kirtana, Japa, Bhagavata class all these things and so we lead a simple modest life but for the service of the Lord, for the glorification of the Lord, we have grand plans. Yes, it involves money. You ask the question, how will this? Uh, we are raising money from people. It's a donation driven project. And uh, uh, we also have some housing facility in the campus. Mm -hmm. So some of our donors can have a house also, okay. but they should also become donors okay. to contribute to the temple to have a house. So that's the kind of an understanding we have. So many people give donation and they also have a house because we are building not only a temple, we are trying to create a community here okay. of devotees who want to come from different places, stay here for one week, 15 days, one month, 
so that they can immerse themselves in bhakti practices, learn more about Krishna and go back and apply what they learn in their lives. So uh, we want to develop a community of about 2,000 or 3,000 residents here. So uh, there is housing and there is donation. And we also have, we want everyone to be involved in the construction of this skyscraper temple for Krishna in Vrindavan. So we have a scheme where anyone can contribute a small amount for a square feet of this temple. Okay. It's only 2,100 rupees for a square feet. Okay. So we invite people to come and participate in this and they can contribute online. And uh, so we want every devotee of Krishna, every Hindu or every, anyone who is, un wants to understand this great message of Krishna from any part of the world, from any nationality to contribute and that way become a blessed participant in the setting up of this grand temple. That is our aspiration. I really hope, I really wish it becomes a huge success. I am looking forward to coming back and see the skyscraper temple here. Sure. So, yes, we will invite you, we will remember to call sure. you. For sure, don't forget <laughs> me. <laughs> and we will be happy to have you here and see the temple for sure and, and shoot things in the temple and carry it in your uh, in, in I would love channels. to I would love to we have uh, actually uh, taken drone shots of this current temple okay. which is in the construction yeah. and I really want to take the drone shot of that 700 feet temple in the future sure. it was really a great conversation it's I would say it's more better than what I expected it was so easy to understand what you're narrating you really have a great narrating skills and I can now I feel like I should read Bhagavad Gita, like <laughs> because I haven't read uh, honestly, but now I feel like I should. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having this conversation. I'll give you two books. Yeah. One is Bhagavad Gita, certainly mm -hmm. I'll give you, written by Prabhupada in simple English. I'll give you another book which you should read before reading Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Science of Self-Realization by Srila Prabhupada. Okay. Prabhupada, when he traveled around the world, he met scholars, he met professors, he met politicians, he met writers and all kinds of people and he had conversations about Krishna, about Bhakti, about Bhagavad Gita. So that makes it very interesting reading. Bhagavad Gita is a little technical. Okay. okay. So uh, I would request, uh, we will share with you uh, yes, Science of Self-Realization mm -hmm. and the Bhagavad Gita. You read first the Science of Self-Realization and then the Bhagavad Gita. Thank and you. you'll have a wonderful understanding and look forward to have more Conversation with you. Off for camera, sure. Can yes. conversations too. For sure. Uh, more interested in sharing yeah. this knowledge and information. Thank you so much. Thanks Namaste. for having me. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. In Vrindavan, they are planning to build a 700 feet temple, which is going to be the world's tallest temple. And they are pledging donations for it. I did my part. I did what I could do. And I really want you all to do what you can. I have attached the link of the donation page in my description. You can all check out and donate what you can and be a part of this project. Thank you.